Welcome to Celebration Church Pretoria Online. We are excited to have the opportunity to connect with you through this online platform. Celebration Church Pretoria is part of the family of churches for Celebration Churches International, founded by Senior Pastors Tom and Bonnie Duchelle. The lead pastors for our Pretoria branch are Pastors Dixon and Itai Katsitsira. There are various ways that you can stay connected with the church. Connect with us on our various online platforms. Join the church WhatsApp group, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and join us on Zoom for different activities. Let us connect in our corporate prayer and fasting every Wednesday, which culminates in our domain prayer meetings from 6 to 7 p.m. on Zoom. If you are a student at the University of Pretoria, get connected with Ignite, our vibrant campus ministry which aims to bring light to the people all around us. Follow the various Ignite social media platforms and hashtag join the movement. Thank you for standing in faith with us and giving towards the purchase of our new building at 459 30th Avenue in Valeria. We are expectant for what God will do through our ministry in this new season. We are believing the Lord that the mortgage bond for our building will be fully paid within the next 24 months. So we encourage you to continue giving to our building project fund. We also invite you to participate in our Compassion's Ministry Pantry Drive, where we will be collecting non-perishable food items to give to those who are in need. If you wish to donate food items, please drop off the goods at our church office in Valeria. Alternatively, you may transfer money into the church bank account with the reference Pantry Drive, and these funds will be allocated accordingly. We also encourage you to continue giving your tithes and offerings through electronic funds transfers. For more information and details regarding what has been mentioned, please do not hesitate to send us a message in our inbox. We invite you to join us now as we praise and worship together. Praise the Lord, amen.
like to invite you to join us for the word of the day. Welcome to Celebration Church Pretoria Online. I am so honored and so privileged to be standing before you today. And I'd just like to say thank you to our pastors, Pastor Dixon and Pastor Itai Katsizira, for giving me this opportunity to share the word with you today. It is such an honor to stand here and it is such an honor to serve in the house that is Celebration Church Pretoria. So I'm just going to begin in a word of prayer and then we'll get straight into the word. Father, we bless and we glorify your name today. We thank you for this time that we have to connect together on this platform to worship you and to hear your word. Lord, I pray that as your word is spoken, may you open up our hearts to hear from you, Lord God. May our hearts be fertile ground for your word. May your word take root in our lives and produce fruit. I surrender before you today and I ask, Lord, that you would have your way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So today I'd like to share with you from one of my favorite passages of scripture, and that is from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I absolutely love this story, and as I was preparing, I realized there's so much to gain, there's so much to learn from the story itself. So I'm going to take almost like a case study approach as we just go through the story together. So if you have your Bible with you, feel free to open it. If you would like to follow the scriptures as they appear on the screen, by all means, go ahead. But let's get into it. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we see King Jehoshaphat. And he's given a report that there are three armies that are making war against him. So in verse 2 it says, Then it was reported to Jehoshaphat that a great multitude has come against you from beyond the Dead Sea, out of Aram, and behold, they are in Hazazon, Tamar. Now there's something Pastor Dixon always says. He says sometimes we are too spiritual when we're reading the Word of God. So a very random story popped into my mind, a true story. But when I was in high school, I played basketball. And this is something a lot of people don't believe me when I say it because I am, I guess, what you would call the small package that dynamite comes in. That's the description I'll use today. But I loved the sport. I played the sport. And there were times when we were playing when I would get the ball. And, you know, sometimes it wasn't even just one person. It could be two or three people from the opposing team just decide to come at me. And I knew in that moment that if they arrived, it was over for me. And I know this is a very random story, you know, compared to what Jehoshaphat was going through, but it got me to think that sometimes in our lives we have situations that are coming that just seem like a great multitude. Sometimes it's multiple things happening at the same time. Sometimes you have a boss that's giving you grief, your children are struggling at school, you have relatives that are not feeling well. There's just so much that is happening and it is just coming at you and I believe this is where Jehoshaphat was at and so in verse 3, rightly so it begins and it says that Jehoshaphat was afraid. He was afraid. 
And I think sometimes there is that initial shock or worry or fear that comes when these situations are happening because you're just thinking, but God, I'm only one person. I, I am a grasshopper here compared to everything that is coming at me. So he was afraid. But I believe what determines whether you're operating in fear or operating in faith is how you respond. And that is what fascinates me about the story of Jehoshaphat. So we're going to look at his response. In verse 3, it goes on and it says that Jehoshaphat was afraid and set himself determinedly as his vital need to seek the Lord. He set himself determinedly as his vital need to seek the Lord. You know, I was thinking in our day and age, we might try to figure out, you know, like, who can I call right now who can help me? Or is there someone who can lend me money? Or um, is there someone who has the right connections to get me out of the situation? Is there someone I can pay to make this situation go away? We would probably start to think of solutions. And I would have thought that Jehoshaphat might think to, to find out if there are any armies in the area that he can form an alliance with, or if he can send money towards um, you know towards the other armies so that they would help him and they would res- so that they would stop coming at him because they've been bribed or given money but that's not what Jehoshaphat did he determined to seek the Lord the Bible says seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you seek first the kingdom and that's what Jehoshaphat did and so that's the first thing I picked up from this story is that we need to seek God first seek God first and not just as a tick box exercise to say I prayed about it but seek God truly with all of your heart as a vital need we need to seek God first So the story continues in verse 3 to 4. It says that he proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. So the people of Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord, longing for him with all of their heart. The second thing I picked up is that we need to have godly community. Do you have people who when you call them and say, I'm going through something, they can stand with you, they can fast with you, they can pray with you, they can encourage you. I have friends where if I so much as say something is going on, they send me voice notes praying for me. They send me scriptures. I have a friend who will without fail send me scriptures that I can stand on. They encourage me in the word and they stand with me. Do you have people? Do you have people that you can stand with? We need godly community. God did not create us to function in isolation he created us to function in community so that is the second thing I picked up have godly community and we continue with the story in verse 5 to 6 Jehoshaphat stands and begins to pray in front of his people and in verse 6 you know I love the way this prayer was said he said O Lord God God of our fathers are you not God in heaven And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand, and there is no one able to take a stand against you. Are you not God in heaven? The first thing Jehoshaphat did as he prayed this prayer was to declare who God is. He knew who God was was and we need to be in a position where we can declare who God is and we know who he is and how do we know who God is through his word the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God so when we know the word of God we know who God is so that's the third thing I picked up is that we need to know God's word we need to know who he is And Maim Slanga was preaching a few weeks ago and she said that in this day and age, we tend to think that it's not necessary to memorize scripture because it's right at our fingertips. I mean, I've become quite proficient in Googling scriptures. I'll type verses about faith, verses about healing, and it will just, it will just come. But the word of God says in Joshua 1 verse 8, that the book of the law, this book of the law shall not depart from your, not from your phone, not from your Google, not from your Bible app not from the bible the physical book but shall not depart from your mouth 
but you shall meditate on it day and night. And how does the word of God get into our mouths? The Bible tells us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I believe that's why the psalmist would say that thy word have I hidden in my heart. I believe Jehoshaphat had hidden this word in his heart that when it came time to speak, he opened his mouth and what came out was who God is, the word of God. So we need to know God's word and we need to know who he is. And then he continues in this prayer in verse 7 and he says, O oh, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Did you not drive people out before? Jehoshaphat declared what God had done in the past. There's a quote I love and it says that your circumstances may lead you to believe that God doesn't exist, but your history will prove that he does. You need to remember the things that God has done in your life. You need to always meditate. Why? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he could have done it before, then surely he can do it again. So when you remind yourself of what God did, it puts you in a position of remembering what God is able to do. So that is the fourth thing I picked up. Remember what God has done. And he continues praying and it's talking about the land um, that was given to Abraham and they lived in it. And in verse 9 it says, you know, we said that if evil comes upon us or the sword of judgment or plague or famine, if anything happens to us, we will stand before this house and before you and we will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear and you will save us. We will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and you will save us. And I remember reading this and thinking, this is not the first time I'm seeing this in scripture. I've seen it so many times where they cried out to God and he saved them or he promised them that if you cry out to me, I will hear you and I will save you. So Jehoshaphat declared what God had said, what God had spoken, what God had promised. Make sure you remember the things that God has said to you. Write them down. Whether you are reading your daily Bible reading and there's revelation through scripture or you are sitting during a service and someone is preaching and you, you catch a word or that someone speaks a word over you, always write it down and remember those things that God has said because God is not a man that he should lie. He is not a man that he should lie. He says that every word he speaks does not return to him void, but it accomplishes exactly what he sent it for. So as long as he's spoken it, he is faithful to fulfill it. And that's why we need to remember what God has said. And that is the fifth thing I picked up. Always remember what God has said. So when you're faced with different situations, as they come at you, like Jehoshaphat, take time to declare who God is, to declare what God has done, to declare the things that he has said. If you're faced with a financial situation, you ask, but God, are you not Jehovah Jireh? Are you not the God who owns a cattle on a thousand hills? God, did you not provide for me to be where I am today? It's because of your provision. God, did you not say that you would supply all of my needs according to your riches and glory when you're faced with anxiety and depression especially in this time so much is attacking our minds but you ask God that God are you not the God of peace are you not Jehovah Shalom is Jesus Christ not the Prince of Peace God did you not guard my heart and my mind through all of my toughest moments God did you not promise me and say that you will keep me in perfect peace as long as my mind is stayed on you when you are faced with sickness you say God are you not Jehovah Jehovah Rapha, Jesus Christ, are you not the great physician? Are you not the one who got beaten and received stripes for my healing? We need to know who God is. We need to remember what he has done and what he has spoken because he is God. And we continue with the story. In verse 10, Jehoshaphat now says to God what is actually happening. And he says, Now behold, the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from the land of Egypt, here they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out of the possession which you have given us as an inheritance. Now, I read this description and I thought it was, it was quite concise. And I was wondering, you know, why was it so concise? 
And I thought to myself, what if he had started this prayer with describing to God what had happened? Now, if Jehoshaphat is anything like me, it, the conversation would probably have gone more like, God, I've just received this report that there are three armies that are coming against me. Three armies, God. Three whole armies. Not one, not two, but three armies. God, they are coming at me. What am I supposed to do with three armies? We are just a small nation. Judah is such a small nation. What if they get here? Are they going to kill all of us? Are they just going to kill the men and then take our women and our children? Are they, oh my gosh, are they going to plunder us and take our wealth? Am I going to be the king that wiped out the nation of Judah from the map? I think that's how I would have described it. Because at the point in verse 3, he was still afraid. But I believe he could describe it in such a short and straight to the point manner because of the order in which he prayed this prayer. By declaring who God is, by declaring what God had done and what he had said, Jehoshaphat was strengthening his faith. He was strengthening his faith and he brought himself to see the situation at hand in the right context or in the right perspective. I googled the definition of perspective and it says a perspective is a particular way of thinking about something, especially one that is influenced by your beliefs or experiences. So I believe if he had started by describing the situation at verse 3, the way he described it would have been influenced by his experience, the great multitude that he's hearing is coming against him. However, because he took time to declare who God is and to bring it to the right perspective, his description was now influenced by his belief in God. So what started off as a massive, massive problem um, when he started to speak and he said, God, are you not God in heaven? Are you not the God with power and might in your hands? God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before? God, if we cry out to you, you said you will hear us and you will save us. So God, here is the situation. He understood the size of the problem. And we need to understand the size of our situation in comparison to the magnitude of our God. So that's the sixth thing I picked up is that you need to have the right perspective. And this prayer continues. And he says, Oh, our God, will you not judge them? Will you not do something about this? For we are powerless against this great multitude. Now I was looking at this and I'm like, but how is he now saying he's powerless after hyping up all these things, getting to this point? But then I remembered there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 from verse 9 to 10 when Paul speaks about the thorn in his flesh. And God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And then Paul says something that has always baffled me. He says, therefore, I will all the more gladly boast in my weaknesses. And I think, I mean, do you boast about weakness? We generally don't boast about our weaknesses. We'll boast about our strengths. But he says, therefore, I will all the more gladly boast about my weaknesses. Why? So that the power of Christ may rest on me. And so I believe at this point, this is just my understanding, that when Jehoshaphat said that, God, we are powerless, he wasn't speaking from a place of fear, but he had understood that God was present. He had called upon the God in heaven so he could say, God, we we are powerless so that the power of God may rest upon them in this situation. And it says, he continues to say, we are powerless against this multitude. We don't know what to do. Listen, you don't need to know what to do. You just need to know the God who does. He says, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on the God who can do something about this. And that's the seventh thing I picked up, that we need to fix our eyes on God. Fix your eyes on Jesus. So the story continues in verse 14 to 17. And we see that God showed up. The Bible says, call to me and I will answer you. So when they called upon the God in heaven with power and might in his hands who drives out armies, God showed up. So the spirit of God comes upon a prophet. And in verse 15, he says, listen carefully, all you people of Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. The Lord says this to you, be not afraid or dismayed at this great multitude for the battle is not yours but God's 
the battle is not yours, but God's. He continued speaking. He said, you will need not fight in this battle. You will not need to fight. You need not fight in this battle. Take your positions. Take your positions. Stand and witness the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. Go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Do not fear, for the Lord is with you. And no, the people didn't just rise and leave after hearing the word, but what they did was they worshipped. Their response to receiving the word of God was that they worshipped. In verse 18, it tells us that Jehoshaphat bowed down and all the people fell down and worshipped God. And as a worshipper, my heart starts to bubble, having read the great connection. And I start to think, God, what kind of praise was this? What kind of worship was it? Was it a Barak praise since they were bowing in adoration to you? Was it a Tauda praise? Was it a sacrifice of praise? Because they hadn't seen the victory yet, but they were praising God. Was it a Shabak praise? because it says that they praised him with a very loud voice so did they send out a shout of victory what did they do but all I know is their response to God's word was to worship him worship God so they got up this is in verse 20 to 22 the next day they got up early they were ready and they went as the prophet had said Jehoshaphat encouraged them and said believe and trust in the Lord your God and you will be established believe and trust in his prophets and you will succeed and then it says when Jehoshaphat had consulted with the people he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in their priestly attire I can just picture Pastor Dixon appointing me when there are three armies coming against us I, I think it's a bit of an interesting choice but okay so he appointed those who sang and they went out before the army and they said, Praise and give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. Praise and give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. And that's what they did. And I won't read the rest of the story, but it's an epic ending. I think this story would actually make a really good movie because when they began to praise and sing, the three armies that were coming to fight them began to fight each other. So they began to fight and kill each other so that when the people of Judah finally arrived at the scene, everyone was dead. There was not a single man standing. And I was like, wow. Wow this God. How epic is that? That he said you will not need to fight in this battle. And they arrived and everyone was dead. So they did not need to fight. And how did this happen? They just sang praise and give thanks to God for his mercy and loving kindness and joy forever. And I started to think about this and I thought, but I, I think I'm, I'm missing something. Because I went back, I had to go back to, to, to verse 17, and I said, but what was the instruction that the prophet actually gave them? And the prophet said to them, take your positions. Um, other versions will say, position yourselves. He told them, you need not fight, just take your positions. And then what they did was to go and praise and give thanks to God. And I was like, but who told them? Who told them to give praise and to give thanks to God. No one, it wasn't said that they should. So why did they praise and why did they give thanks? Because praise, because worship, because thanksgiving is a position. They were told to take their positions and they praised and gave thanks to God. It is a position and I will go as far as saying that it is not just a position but it is our default position because nobody needed to tell them. They were told to take their positions and they stood in praise and thanksgiving to God and this reminded me of Isaiah 43, 43 21 which Pastor Bonnie teaches us on all the time. She will come and she will shout Isaiah and then we'll all scream 4, 3, 2, 1 the people I formed for myself shall declare my praise and then we will scream and we will jump and we will dance and we will praise God and it's true the people that God formed for himself shall declare his praise 
and no, not the people who can sing that he formed for himself, not just the people he formed for himself shall declare his praise on a Sunday morning at church, not just the people I formed for myself should declare my praise when they want something, but the people that he formed for himself, his children, when we accepted Christ, we became children of God, we were given the right to be children of God, we became co-heirs with Christ, so we are his children. We are the people that God formed for himself. Romans 12 verse 1 tells us that we should offer ourselves as a daily living sacrifice. This is our reasonable and acceptable worship. This is an everyday thing. We are a living sacrifice because praise, because worship is our default position. And as I was thinking through this, I immediately thought to Acts 16, where we see Paul and Silas in prison. And it's another epic story where people sang and praised God, and then God did these amazing things, right? So they were sitting in a prison cell, and they sang psalms and hymns to God, and then there was an earthquake, and then the doors of the prison opened. And I started to ask the same questions. And I thought, but why did they sing? Why did they give praise? Because... I mean, I don't think their goal was necessarily to get out of the prison because when the doors did open, they didn't walk out. What happened is they saw the jailer and Paul led the jailer to Christ and that was the calling on Paul's life. So I don't think he was too concerned about trying to leave or get out of the prison. And there is no conversation where Silas says, listen, Paul, I think if we just sing one or two songs, just one or two songs, these doors might open. That conversation did not happen. They were in chains but they sang hymns and psalms to God. And I said, but why did they sing? Who told them? No one told them to sing. They sang because praise, thanksgiving, worship is our default position. It was their default. So whether they were sitting in chains in a prison cell, they praised. So whether you find yourself in chains in a prison cell, you praise God. Whether you are still waiting for your victory, you give thanks to God. Whether you are celebrating a breakthrough that has come through, you worship God. The Bible says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That is Psalms 34. Psalms 113 says, from the rising of the sun until its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. 1 Thessalonians tells us that in everything, in everything, every circumstance, every situation, give thanks. In everything, give thanks for This is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Let everything, everything that has breath, as long as you are breathing, you should be praising. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That is your default position. So the story in 2 Chronicles 20 suddenly starts to make even more sense to me because the people of Judah, Judah means praise. They are a people that resided in the position of praise and worship. So I think it was easy for Jehoshaphat to start the prayer and declare who God is. Because if he resides in praise and worship, as he praises, you are constantly declaring who God is. So it wasn't hard for him to just start and declare who God is. It wasn't hard for him to remember the things that God had done because they are constantly giving thanks to God. So they are constantly reminding themselves of the things that God has done. So he was able to declare that they knew God's character. They knew God's power they knew his word they knew his acts because praise and thanksgiving are a default position that was their default position so i ask you today as the title of the message is what is your position praise and thanksgiving is our default position as children of god I will end with Psalms 100 today, which is our praise psalm or thanksgiving psalm. It says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. Know who God is. Know that the Lord is God and it is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. We are the people he formed for himself. We are his. And so what? So enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. 
His faithfulness continues through all generations. Praise and give thanks to God, for he is good. He is always good. His love endures forever. His mercies endure forever. His faithfulness endure forever. That will never change. So that is the position that we take, the position of praise and thanksgiving to God, because his love, his mercies, his faithfulness, they endure forever. Now you could be listening to me today and you could be saying to me that Dudu, I hear what you are saying. And I mean, I've been in different positions. I've, I've tried to trust in other things or to worship other things or other people, but none of it has seemed to quite work out for me. And, I, and I'm hearing of this position that you are speaking of. And I, I think I want to be in that place. Dudu, how do I get to that place? Or you may be saying to me that Dudu, I was in that position. I was, once upon a time, but everything that has happened has been so much. There has been so much that has gone wrong. Life has just happened. There's the cares of this world, and I feel I'm so far from that position, Dudu, that you are speaking about, and I want to come back, but I don't know how. And it's simple. Have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? The Bible tells us in Romans 10, verse 9 to 10, that if you acknowledge and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, then you will be saved. It says, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in his justification, that is being made righteous, being freed from the guilt of sin, and being made acceptable to God. And with the mouth he acknowledges and confesses his faith openly, resulting in and confirming his salvation. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. You will be given the right to become a child of God and come and partake and be in this position. So if you're one of those two people that I've mentioned, I encourage you to say this prayer with me today. Lord, I thank you that you formed me for yourself. Jesus, I thank you for laying down your life for me, that I too may have the right to become a child of God. I confess my sin, and I ask you to cleanse me by your precious blood. I believe in my heart that you died for me and were raised from the dead. Today, I boldly and openly declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. I surrender my life to you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. And for everyone else, I encourage you to evaluate. I know it's been a long year and it's been a tough year for most, but evaluate where you are at. What is your position? And if your position is not praise, if it's not thanksgiving, this is our month of thanksgiving. Come back to the position of praise, the position of worship, because that is our default. Praise and give thanks to God for his mercy and his loving kindness and joy forever. Have a blessed week. Amen. for joining us today. We hope that you have been blessed by this message. Remember to share this message with others and meditate on the word during the week. We look forward to connecting with you again this week in our cell and prayer meetings. Join us again next week for our next Sunday service. Have a blessed week.